All right. Welcome, everyone. This is a podcast from yours truly, David Morgan of themorganreport.com. And today I have Keith Wiener, the CEO of Monetary Metals. And Keith and his staff, I'd say mostly Keith wrote it because I know how he writes. It's the gold outlook for 2022. And I'm holding it in my hand. I just finished reading it for the second time. And we are certainly not going to go through every page. So what I recommend is everybody go to Monetary Metals and get on their email list and get uh, also to get this report and download it. As you can see, I made a hard copy that may not be necessary for you, but I like old school. I like to highlight stuff, which I did. So I'd have some good questions for Keith. And I like to make notes in the margin and all that, especially when I know he's wrong. But um, having said that, <laughs> he did, but what a great poker face you have. I am going to start off. So, Keith, um, give us some background about yourself and Monetary Metals. So, first of all, it's monetary-metals.com in case anybody is looking for the URL background. So, I was your typical computer nerd in high school. And... Um, Went off to major in computer science, dropped out of that, got bored, felt I didn't have anything to offer me at the undergraduate level after a certain point. Uh, wanted to build a software company, which I did. It was called Diamondware. Um, I sold that company to North Hall Networks. The transaction closed August 19, 2008, which um, the data in itself isn't that auspicious, but it was the last acquisition that North Hall closed. They had others that were in the works because I knew some of the CEOs that didn't close. Um, Nortel began to spiral into bankruptcy, which they finally declared in January uh, a couple of months later. And obviously the fall of 2008 was uh, you know, quite an epic collapse. So here I'm sitting there. I built a company for 14 years, had my liquidity event trying to figure out how to protect myself, started to study markets and economics to figure out what the heck was going on because nobody was really trying to get at the root of it. Um, eventually came to study economics. Um, that's crazy. Uh, and I say that uh, in, in the kindest possible way, a crazy old Hungarian professor named Trekete, uh, who I didn't know whether he was right or wrong at that point, but I figured he was the only guy who seemed to be trying to get to the root of it, asking how does this thing begin and what's, what's the origin. Um, eventually getting a, uh, uh, awarded a PhD from him, not accredited. I could never get a job with that degree, but uh, the work was real anyway. Um, and uh, for my next venture, I said, you know, if this was a normal world, it would have been a software company. By that point, I had a team that followed me to hell and back. They were all saying, Keith, when's the next gig? We're ready to jump. I had access to capital. I had great advisors. I think I had learned a thing or two about how to do a software company by that point. But I said, I want to be involved in something that um, is, is part of the solution. I want to be part of the solution. It was clearly a very great monetary ill, monetary disease, and uh, gold is clearly part of the solution. That's what I want to do next. And so um, that was the origin of monetary metals. And, and really on, on one uh, um, insight that when I was giving economics lectures at that time, I was talking about the interest rate in gold is the is the regulator of flow. It's like a regulator control valve. And if the interest rate's zero, you get no circulation. All the gold that's mined just disappears into private hoards. But if the interest rate's positive and sufficiently high, then that will pull the gold into the market. Uh, so that was both an economic premise and then ultimately the um, the premise for uh, founding the company. And um, something that I think we've now proved definitively in the real world lab um, that that's true, that, that interest pulls gold and silver out with no other force uh, you know, can do that. You know, the communist governments send people around door to door with machine guns. They don't really get a lot of gold. I mean, if they catch somebody by surprise, you know, maybe they give over a little bit. But uh, for the most part, all they do is they, they get people to bury it deeper. It was a term in 1933 when uh, the U.S. made gold illegal for a while, called midnight gardening. Exactly. You know, that term, people would just go out and um, bury it, sure. and then they put flour on top, so the neighbors wouldn't be suspicious. Why is there freshly turned earth there in your in your garden? Well, it's just a flower, you know. And you were gardening, and you planted that flower at midnight. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I digress just a moment. I just want a yes or no answer. I hate to be controller, but you must have read uh, Summer's uh, interest rates and gold uh, thesis, right? Uh, Larry Summers. Oh, Larry Summers. I'm kind of familiar with that. I actually haven't read the paper itself. Yeah, it, it's an interesting read. So we move on. So the first thing that came up is, you know, your honesty. I've known you for years. I uh, have a link for you on my blog page, uh, which we'll get to at the end, and what you can do with your your business. But um, the first thing was you talked about your calls from, I think it was 2016. I'm not going to go back. Uh, but, you know, for the last few years, some were good, some weren't so good. Always admire that. I could fall in that camp myself. And then, of course, I think you started this one off, and I'm paraphrasing. You can interject if I'm totally off base, but it's like this is going to be one of the hardest years ever. And of course, that was before Ukraine. So when you wrote this, um, you know, <laughs> there were lots of variables that were indeterminable. It was like a partial differential equation with super hypotenuse as the as the lowercase on the integral. It was really tough. So sorry, folks. I'm just out of the key. Uh, so first thing I want to touch on was how not to think about gold. And in there you say, there's one thing that's wrong theories and the non-theories get right, well, the, 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 but both get right. The dollar really is a problem and it really is failing. This is why we give the same advice every year. To anyone who does not own gold or silver, you should own some period without regard to price. Now. You know, I know it's smart yard, but I love it when you get down to like the, you know, absolute basics, ground up, common sense, you know, man can understand and he said it right there. So let me leave it with that opening and why don't you go ahead and add on to where you'd like, Keith. Yeah, so I think, um, and this was uh, mostly the team doing the the, uh, the hard work. So um, a shout out to, to Dixon and Ben for um, going back and, and uh, putting together a store, scorecard for my calls over the last 10 years. Um, and uh, last year was not one that, uh, that we did so well on. Uh, but, um, you know, that's that's absolutely right. And I, and I think, you know, we're, we're all in agreement, violent agreement in that probably, that the dollar's failing. So if you thought that you were on a ship that was sinking, wouldn't you at least own, I don't know, an inner tube, an inflatable raft, a lifeboat, I mean, something? Um, you know, if not a uh, ticket on a helicopter out, wouldn't you want some sort of way off this thing that you know is about to go down into the drink? You know, sooner you didn't know when, but you know, at some point. Um, so that's that's what that kind of really advice that's just like, hey, you know, wake up, you know, something's going on here uh, to be aware of. And um, I think every few years we have an event that wakes people up. So. Um, you know, in 2008, uh, you know, not only did we have this crisis and everything crashing, but then the response to that was just sheer madness. What the Fed, but all, it wasn't just the Fed uniquely, it was all the central banks went absolutely insane. And, um, you know, in, in terms of the amount of quantitative easing and the other things they did. In 2020, they locked the world down, heedless of the economic consequences of that. And then as if this compensates for it, went on a monetary madness so great that the 2008 madness looks like a, a mere pixel, you know, mere little blip in the chart. Uh, but back in 2008, that was no mere pixel. That was complete moonshot compared to everything that had occurred previously. So each thing, first of all, they, these things recur. But then secondly, the next one is so much bigger than the last. It makes the last look like... Um, you know, child's play by comparison. And every time this happens, I, I think a certain number of people newly discover the idea that they should own some gold and silver. They had never really considered it before. And that clearly happened after 2020. That clearly, you know, previous time that happened was clearly 2008. And then you get a step function up in, in price, you know, despite um, you know, all the years of doldrums post-2011, you know, the price never revisited the pre-2008 era, you know, level of, of pricing, where, you know, you had price ranging from, what, 300 bucks to 1,000 bucks. Well, in the post-2011 bust, if you want to call it that, or bear market, we never revisited 300 to 900. Um, and now, 2020, you know, we'll see, 
we'll see where the new floor is. Um, but anyway, there's the sheer insanity going on, and that's um, a big part of my argument in 2021, why I predicted you know, higher gold prices, uh, which didn't occur in 2021, but the reasons are still there. And, and now we have into 2022 with seemingly even more reasons. And one that, um, you know, was not, at least by me, foreseeable uh, at the time of writing that report in February, or I'm sorry, excuse me, in January when that was written, which was Ukraine. Right. All right. So uh, moving on, you put out a very interesting thing, and I'm not, I don't want to hash this too much, but, uh, you know, about the supply-demand fundamentals of, of gold, and then you point out very succinctly that, look, the Royal Gold Council tells us we have 6 billion ounces of gold. Then you go on to say there's means that there's no such thing as a glut in gold, and that means annual mine production numbers are virtually, virtually meaningless. And I agree with all of those statements. What would lead humans to demand gold and silver in this way? So uh, that's on the next page. So from that, there isn't a glut in gold. There's always demand for it. We do, you know, have a bid ask spread. We do the price in dollars changes, but there's basically an inexhaustible demand for money is what I would call it. I'm going to speak for myself. You can, you know, obviously say whatever you'd like. But one of the, one of the first guys I hired was from Russia. And he pointed it out to me, and I hadn't thought about it, but not thought about it deeply. He said, well, what's the demand for money? And the demand is really inexhaustible. I mean, as long as there's a new person on the planet that wants something they don't have, there's probably an increase in demand. That's on the aggregate, of course. And, of course, we all have a budget. So even if you're a billionaire, you've only got one billion or two billion or four. You know, I'm trying to be a little bit humorous. So. I don't really want to rehash that. What I'd like to go, go is to the next page where you highlighted a change in the desire to hoard or just hold gold, even a small one, can have a big impact on price. Can you go through that? So money is the thing you hold when you don't want to invest or speculate in something else. So if you look at stocks and think too risky, too overpriced, you look at real estate and you think at this cap rate, there's nothing there you know in it that makes any sense for me you look at um so-called non-fungible tokens and crypto and all those things and you think okay somebody's making a fortune there but i don't really know enough about what's going to go up and what's going to go down so if, if if i look through the financial universe and i think okay there's nothing there that i really need to own then i then i have gold um people will trade that gold for dollars in order to make an investment or speculation that of course is dollar denominated, and then they'll sell the dollars when they don't see anything they want to do. So if the interest rate falls, not just falls relative to where the interest rate was yesterday, but if the interest rate falls below, um, I think you know the, the right term here would be marginal time preference. Then you see people at the margin saying essentially there's no investment that pays a yield sufficient to justify the risk. Uh, including obviously the risk of currency debasement because the investment is denominated in currency. So if you buy, you know, ten-year Treasury bond, it's not that you're necessarily worried that the Treasury isn't going to be able to pay when the when the bond comes due. The question is, what is the value of the currency with which they pay when the bond comes due? So if you look at all that and think, you know, so right after COVID hit, the interest rate on the ten-year Treasury falls to 0.5 percent. It had been 1.9 percent. Um, you know, end of 2019, early January 2020, at 1.9%, you can see a lot of people say, okay, that's pretty good. I'm getting a return on money. I'm, I'm getting ahead. You know, maybe they're not thinking about inflation that much, but at 0.5%, the case is, you know, comes into sharper focus that you're, you're certainly falling behind with that. And so then uh, the demand for money, the demand for gold, um, you know, changes. And obviously the price following COVID, the price of gold certainly changed. Um, so it's, it's that type of factor that, um, and you know, and there are a lot of them, uh, but that people, um, you know, in a certain sense, you could say, who knows what goes through somebody's mind, somebody's mind when they buy gold for the first time. But in a certain sense, you can point to, you know, increasing risk, right? So in the wake of COVID, not only the interest rate fall, but the other thing that happened was the so-called CARES Act. So we take a federal government that's already running 
at a trillion dollar deficit. Uh, there's some accounting gimmick by which they report it as less than that. But if you go to the Treasury Department runs a site called Debt to the Penny, and you, you pull up what was the debt in um, April 1, 2019, and what was the debt in um, you know, March 31, 2020, you see it goes up by over a trillion. You take that over a trillion dollar deficit and say, now let's destroy revenues by shutting businesses down. And at the same time, let's spend $2.3 trillion on the CARES Act. And then to that 2.3, they said that's not enough. And they passed the supplement to the CARES Act, which I don't know if that ever had a name or what the name of that was. But it's a total of $2.8 trillion. That they just, just like that, on top of what was already running at a trillion dollar deficit, okay. even if you weren't um, you know, unhappy with the interest rate, surely you'd have to be just a little bit uncomfortable about you know, these guys that are making drunken sailors look, you know, miserly by comparison. <laughs> miserly, right. Right. And so I think for those two reasons, a lot of people said, you know, basically, screw it, I'm buying some gold. And uh, and they did. And, um, you know, so we have a big step up in the price of gold, which hasn't really come back to the levels that, you know, it had been. And, um, you know, and so it goes in each, each iteration. There's something else that's crazy that um you know drives the next set of people to to buy gold great and then you go through your your metrics i'm not going to spend any time here keith i'll just say that people should download the report and read it but you talk about the basis of co-basis you talk about buyers and sellers you talk about spreads you talk about wide spreads and you talk about backwardation we've been through that on our mastermind course once or twice and it's spelled out really good because i want to focus you know since i get to interview you so i get to allocate the time and I just really was fascinated with everything you wrote about it because I've been on a bit of a exploration situation for several interviews with many different people on a lot about Bitcoin. But I really like what you said, you know, I mean, it was very factual. I know you think it's similar to an engineer, or at least I'll put that on you. You can deny it in a moment. But or logically, maybe is a better word. But Bitcoin is not a Ponzi scheme. And that's true. It's not. It's more like a pyramid scheme. And then you talk about that and discuss it. And one thing you said here is that Bitcoin is therefore like any other bull market fueled by the falling interest rate. They serve as a mechanism for the conversion of one party's capital into another's income to be consumed. And you make that point two or three times in here saying that when you buy a Bitcoin, you're actually providing, in our case, US dollars to someone that's willing to sell a Bitcoin. And that becomes um their funds and you've given up yours hoping for a price appreciation talked a lot about volatility which i think i'll just say generally is huge in the bitcoin market you pointed out as i have that it went to 67,000 uh highest in or 67.5 to be what you wrote and that was the all-time high in us dollar terms and within a couple of months, it was down to 33,000. I have to digress just for my viewers for a moment. I was one of the few taking the kind of the opposite side of the crypto craze way back in the beginning. I was speaking in Australia and uh, there were some gray hairs in the audience. And we got done with the panel. I was the only one that was neutral and maybe slightly bearish on the whole thing. And this old gentleman stood up and he, you know, he could just sat and talk to the panel, but he got up and he said, Whenever something does that, now this is pre-67 to 33, but a similar volatile move. It says you can't have a currency that you know, does a 50% jump in one day. It can't serve as a currency. So I digress. Let me come back. Um, I'll get to the question here. I think it's one of the keys that you wrote here on uh, page 16, I think. One does not put dollars into Bitcoin. One does not convert dollars to Bitcoin. One forks over one's savings to a former owner of Bitcoin who sells Bitcoin to you. The seller now has the dollars which he can spend on his prof as his profits. The seller is spending your savings. So further comment, Keith. Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll add two things to that. One, I think, I think it's really important to try to be as precise as one can in, in anything, but when, when talking about money, which can seem so abstract, and so um, arcane to try to make it tangible and concrete at every step. 
people talk about converting dollars. You know, some of the guys with the laser eyes on Twitter, you know, if you've seen this or you're seen this, where, you know, for a while, it seems to be less popular now that the Bitcoin price has come down a bit, but they would Photoshop or there's some tool, I don't know how they do it, to put these red laser eyes, you know, beams coming out of their eyes. And, you know, they would talk about convert all your dollars to Bitcoin. Well, you know, in a certain sense, okay, you get what they're saying, just like when a four-year-old says there are little people in the TV. You sort of get what he's saying. But in reality, there's nobody in that TV. You know, I've got news for anybody that still believes in the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus. They're not real. And you're not converting dollars to Bitcoin. You're trading. You have dollars, somebody else has Bitcoin, and then after the transaction, you have Bitcoin, someone else has dollars. So you're just exchanging the dollars for the Bitcoin, which, okay, neither here nor there, until you realize that that person who sold you the Bitcoin, let's say at um, $68,000, you know, he bought it at $10,000. So he has a $58,000 profit, but his profit doesn't come from financing something productive. His profit comes out of your savings, which he can spend. And so anytime you have a bull market of this sort, I'm not talking about when, um, you know, companies are actually producing more and making more money, but everything today is fueled by central banks. That's the elephant in the room, including Bitcoin. Although the Bitcoiners don't want to think that's right. I'll back um, you up. And so what the central banks have done, right? So so it, it goes back to the ancient idea of socialism, which is that the whole economy is driven on consumption. Keynesianism is a consumerism model. How do you get people to consume more? And recession is when people, for some reason, suddenly don't want to consume, which is absurd on its face anyway. Everybody always wants to consume more. And there's no such thing as, oh, I, I'll take a holiday from consumption. I just want to be austere. Today, I'm going to put on my sackcloth robe and my little rope belt, and I'm just going to tighten it a little tighter today. Nobody sets out to do that, right? But the whole thing is, how do you drive consumption? And what they figured out after the failure of, you know, overt communism, where the government has a gun to your head and forces you to do this and forces you to do that, and then they just print ration coupons and give everybody and say, you get a pair of shoes you get a rope belt and you get this and you get that, and they couldn't produce any of it anyway, is instead through the central bank, they try to find ways to stimulate more consumption, which is their you know, utopian ideal. And, um, but it, what it does is it fuels the prodigal society, we refer to the prodigal son. This is the prodigal society, everybody's spending somebody else's savings via the magic of assets that go up. And um, that's, uh, um, uh, anyway, so but but if you look at the mechanics and say it's not a conversion of dollars to Bitcoin, it's actually an exchange, then then you can see, um, you know, you can see that this is so. Everybody understands. Okay, I bought Bitcoin at ten, I sold it at sixty-eight. I have a fifty-eight thousand dollar profit. I'm going to go buy myself a brand new Beamer, and everyone is okay with that. And and my point is, just take a look at what really happened. Well, someone else had fifty-eight thousand or sixty-eight thousand in savings that he forked over to you, and that's where the Beamer is. And that person thinks he's made an investment. He's actually just bought you a brand new Beamer because he thinks someone's going to buy him a brand new Lamborghini. Exactly. That's why he bought you the brand new Beamer. Yeah. And maybe somebody will buy him the brand new Lamborghini. I, I have no idea what yep. the price is going to be. Um, maybe that will be true, but how long can that go on if the entire society has gone prodigal? You know, I don't know. Adam Smith said there's a great deal of ruin in a nation and there's a great deal more ruin than anybody would have thought, you know, if you started looking at this in 2008. Page 19, you write under the subtitle, The Social Phenomena of Bitcoin. Bitcoin promoters believe that Bitcoin technology is the final destination, not a jury. And I would like you to comment on that because I have had some runs with some of the Bitcoin maximalists. Look, I will just add my four cents. I'll speak a moment, but nature preaches balance. You know, there's a balance in an economic system. If it's free to decide, you know, the market's free, you'll get a balance. Oversupply, a price, price will, you know, arbitrate between the two. But Bitcoin, this idea that you wrote, tell us more. So, um, you know, where do you even start with that? Obviously, the world of technology, you know, the story of technology is the story of one innovation after another. 
and each new innovation was not foreseen by anybody previous to that. So I, I like to use the sort of a personal example. Travis Kalanick had this realization, so he's the founder of Uber, that number one, the taxi experience is terrible. And number two, everybody's carrying around always on internet connected, high resolution graphics, smartphone that was capable of not only summoning a ride, but you know, doing so with all kinds of features that you could never have dreamed before. The coolest of which is when you're waiting for that car, you can see that, you know, there's a little map of your street area and you can see that little thing as it's turning and going through to, to get to you. So, you know, if you're hanging out with friends, uh, finishing up, uh, you know, a beer after dinner and you call that car, you don't have to wait out in the cold and the rain. You can just sit there until the car is literally pulling up to the curb. Then you jump out and, uh, you know, get into the car. So it was a radically improved experience. Nobody foresaw that before Travis Kalanick did. Um, I didn't, and I, I came up with something that nobody foresaw, which is 3D voice, um, the technology that ultimately was sold to Nortel. So each, even, the, even the other entrepreneurs in tech don't necessarily see other entrepreneurs' you know, vision until that person makes it real. And um, you know, the same thing you know, is going to occur with Bitcoin that and has occurred, right? I mean, there are succeeding generations of crypto you know, currencies that the Bitcoin maximalists will dismiss and then they have a term. So to keep this polite for a family audience, we'll call it beep coins. Um, but they have a term that obviously isn't beep, but there's an expletive deleted there. Um, and so they're just highly dismissive, derisive of anything that would be an improvement. And they have to be. And the reason is, if there is a new innovation that is better in some important way that the market deems to be important than Bitcoin, and if that new thing is developed independently by an independent third party, then that thing could displace or replace Bitcoin. So it's one thing, you know, and the first thing that they'll do is they'll move the goalposts and they'll say, well, the Bitcoin consortium or the Bitcoin, whatever they call it, is you know, innovating all the time. And that's true enough. But usually the disruptive innovation doesn't come from the consortium of, you know, the old money and the old corporations. Usually it comes from outside of that. So, you know, you had a couple of companies that made mainframe computers, and then you had a whole new set of companies that made mini computers. And then of those companies, none of them were the developer of the PC and what became the PC industry, the microcomputer. And then of the microcomputer companies, none of them were the innovators on, you know, smartphones. I guess arguably Apple was, um, but a different market, a different play. If there was a new cryptocurrency that wasn't plug compatible with Bitcoin, more importantly, was started by somebody else doing their own thing, they have no interest in giving a trillion dollars in free value worth of their coin to all the Bitcoin people. Um, and so uh, what would happen in that case is Bitcoin would decline in value and maybe eventually become worthless. So I think they sense this at some gut level. They kind of realize that that's what would happen. So they have to deny the very possibility of it. That's not even possible. So therefore, why are we even talking about this? That's just arbitrary. Well, the history of technology would, would beg to differ with that. Further on, you talk about uh, Bitcoin was designed to use more and more computing power as time goes on. You know, I was introduced to it very early. Didn't mine any from my home computer, which you could have done at one time. And then you talk about, you know, and I've gotten in arguments with people. I mean, a fact is a fact, and I don't like, I don't argue facts. You can't. But the amount of, um, you know, electricity that Bitcoin uses is equivalent to, and I don't know, one was like the power requirement for Denmark or something. You can correct me in the comments if you want. Point being that the maximalists particularly will say, well, that means absolutely nothing because it's the same as like the gaming that's done in the United States. Or they've got all these, you know, takeoffs on this, why it doesn't matter if what you flare off at an oil well. Anyway, in other words, it's okay to waste energy. I'm not saying it's wasted. Uh, let me reframe that. Really, I'm going to brick the But the way it's designed is you continually make it a more and more complex uh, math problem that requires more energy. 
And I've been told, I haven't verified this, that uh, the Bitcoin miners have to replace their hardware about every two or three years because they need to ramp up what the server capability is, the cooling and everything else because of the, I don't know if it's exponential or not, you may know, Keith, but the complexity of the math required. So it's a, it's a fallacy to me. And, and I've said all that to say this, I'll be succinct now. The ESG move, the greenies out there that are trying to stir into everything that we think, do and say, eat, how we travel, our carbon footprint and everything else, I can't see where there isn't a collision course for the amount of energy used mining Bitcoin versus how green it is for the planet. Your comments, please. Um, I'm not necessarily uh, buying into the, the idea of man-made catastrophic global warming. Um, but leaving that aside, my, my criticism of Bitcoin's consumption of energy, number one, comes from the flawed and Marx was a real, I don't think he was the one who originated the idea, but Marx was a big believer in the labor theory of value. Something has value because of the work required to produce it. And Bitcoin literally made that so. Um, but rather, you know, again, if you look at the history of, of technology and the development of technology, things go from using lots of resources to produce one unit of, let's say, a car, or let's say an airplane, or let's say a locomotive or whatever, a computer, um, taking lots and lots of resources to produce that, and they're, you know, prohibitively expensive to most people. Um, there was kind of a slightly infamous quote from um, Thomas J. Watson, CEO of IBM, saying that he predicted worldwide demand for computers was something like a dozen or two dozen units would be the global demand for a computer. Yep, yeah, right. That's right. You know, less than 24 computers worldwide. Yeah. Well, sure. You know, if, if you price it at, at $10 million in 1955 dollars, sure, that very few people would want one. Um, and those things, you know, took up a room. They took 240 volt power, if not 480 volt, um, you know, and, and had, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of vacuum tubes in them, each of which, you know, cost real money and real resources to produce. And um, over time, the amount of resources to produce that computer and the amount of electricity and also you know human um resources to maintain that computer keeps going down and down and down so it's not just the electricity but in the 1950s and 1960s you had to have you know uh specialty personnel to be operating that computer and keeping it you know maintained and running you know today you've got this supercomputer in your pocket and you think nothing of it and you pull it out to make a phone call with it um so Everything has gotten, you know, gone from using more resources to using rest, less. I'm not going to necessarily go with the argument that, you know, humans use too much. I'm not going to go with the argument that there's some magic number of, you know, carbon or, or any other uh, resource that um, people should be using. But just rather the trend and everything else in human existence is to go from needing more to needing less. And Bitcoin is the one thing that would seem to buck the entire trend of humanity and technology development over thousands of years, which is to need more, more resources. And so there's something about that from an economics perspective that doesn't quite work. Um, and that ultimately that's going to be on collision course with um, economic law and, you know, in reality. And whether the ESG people or the, you know, green energy people get them, you know, even if not, they're still on a collision course. It still isn't going to work. Well said. So I want to get to Gold Outlook 2022. But before I get there, I think you did one of the more succinct and uh, powerful arguments about hiking interest rates and why this is, I'll use the word, almost impossible. I said almost. So would you go through your thoughts on uh, hiking interest rates that you have in this study? Yeah, you know, the first thing I do when people say that, you know, this is that interest rates are finally going to turn around and begin skyrocketing. I say, you know, interest rates have been falling for 40 years. Um, what's your theory on what caused them to fall for 40 years such that your theory now predicts a change? Like whatever force has been driving it is acknowledged and understood. And now you think that force has stopped operating for some reason. And I know what my theory is. And my theory is that when the market interest rates above marginal return on capital, then you get a falling interest rate because there's little to no demand for credit except on a downtick in interest rates. 
Let me stop you there. I know exactly what you said, but I got a degree in finance. So the interest rate from the bond market is X. And if your your margin is uh, higher than that, then the interest rates better fall or else you're not going to be making a profit any further. Is that a well, more of a If your margin is higher than that, then you're fine. So you know, put it in really simple terms. Suppose you're running yeah, a hamburger sure. joint. Suppose you're running a hamburger joint and um, you get an 8% return on capital. Um, so, you know, you have a million dollars worth of capital invested in the store. 8% is um, 80 grand. So if you're making 80 grand net on a million dollars invested capital, you have an 8% return on capital. How much money do you want to borrow if the interest rate is 10%? That's how much money. And I'm not trying to be boring here saying, that was 10,000 men. Could you? Um, <laughs> but... Um, you can't borrow any money if the cost of borrowing is higher than your return on capital. So when the um, uh, interest rate falls, so it goes from 10% to 9%. Do you want to borrow any money as a hamburger joint making eight? No. It falls to 8%. Do you want to borrow any money? Probably not, but at least now they've got your attention. It falls to 7% and 6% and 5% and 4%. There is a, a line there that says, I'm going to do it. Now it makes sense to me. My business case has suddenly clicked. If I have a spreadsheet, you know, the red, the bottom line is red, it suddenly flipped to black. At least when I program spreadsheets, I like to have a color to kind of indicate is this pass fail, green, red, black, red, whatever colors you want to use, you know, it clicks into yes, let's do it. Now here's the thing. If I and every other hamburger joint owner suddenly at let's say six and a half percent or wherever that magic line is. Um, decide to borrow to open up more hamburger stores, assuming that there isn't suddenly a greater appetite for hamburgers, assuming that the sole reason why my, myself and all my competitors are borrowing to add more hamburger pack capacity is simply the falling interest rate, then what happens to the return on capital in the hamburger business? Balls. Yeah. I mean, you double the number of hamburger stores, law supply and demand says you're going to get a lower price for the hamburger. So margins fall. Um, hang on one second. I forgot to turn off my phone. And somebody did the rude discourtesy of hopefully, hopefully you can clip that out. Um, uh, so more hamburger stores equals a falling margin. You can't make as much money selling burgers anymore. And so what happens is the falling interest rate tends to pull down the profit margin, the return on capital in the hamburger business and every other business that's capital intensive. Uh, so the interest rate keeps falling, it's pulling down the return on capital everywhere. Um, and of course, just everybody's piling up debt. Everybody's in debt up to their eyeballs. Um, and now you suddenly say, we're gonna hike interest rates. So there's a term, uh, and this is not coined by Zero Hedge or some alt fringe you know, uh, uh, group on the internet this is coined by the Bank for International Settlements and the term is zombie. 20% yep. of all the corporate debt out there is so-called zombie debt. A zombie is a corporation whose profit is less than their interest expense. And um, if they were to hike the interest rate, uh, a greater number of companies would obviously be in that same boat. Uh, so can they hike interest rates? I said in 2015, the last time that there was serious you know chatter that or i should say promised by the fed that we're going to do it and that was Janet yellen um i said they can't really hike interest rates very far and if they do they won't be able to hold it very long and um you know today the situation is much more dire than it was in 2015. um can they do this how long can they hold the line what will the consequences be if they attempt it and um I think it's pretty clear uh, they won't be able to get as far as they did in 2015. Um, somebody had uh, posted a graph to Twitter I thought was really interesting, and they called it the Caterpillar graph. So this was this was a picture of the Fed funds rate, which is the primary interest rate that the Fed um, cool. controls. And um, what they had on it were all these little fuzzy lines every once in a while, and those fuzzy lines indicated the trend of whatever economists get pulled for this. Nobody ever calls me up and says, Keith, what's your opinion? 
when interest rates are going. But they but they pull the you know the head economists, the the big banks and big think tanks and whatever. And every time there was the slightest blip in the Fed funds rate, and even places where there weren't, there was all of these diagonal lines of these projections going up, up and to the right. And um, so anyway, this was the so-called caterpillar graph. It's amazing how we've had this falling trend for 40 years, and every time there's a blip, everyone says rates are going to be rising. I just know it. I just feel it. Now is the time. And they're always wrong. And, um, and I think the reason is nobody is really thinking about the debtor at the margin or the, or the potential, you know, the marginal borrower. And um, can, that, can that party borrow? Is this anything like the 1970s today? Um, and, and, and the answer is, is no, it's nothing like the 1970s today. And I concur. I will just add as a devil's advocate, unless they absolutely 100% want to crash it to to never never land. I mean you could raise interest rates and uh crash it, burn it, it's over as a metaphor. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. I just want to throw that out there because I made that comment on a few of my interviews. Not saying it's even conceivable, but in theory, if you could perceive it. So you go on and talk about the outlook for 2022 and obviously I'm going to give you free reign here in a minute, but before I forget it, highlighted it um so as you unravel your 2022 please do not leave out the statement that is in this report fear of zombie defaults will drive two trends one the fed will have to loosen credit which we already discussed fairly well two market participants will increasingly prefer gold to counterparty risk so if you could work that into you know, we don't need it read to us, but uh, you know, it's a great interview so far. I'd like you to get what probably most people are waiting for. So, what was the first part that you couldn't hear you. outlook for 2022? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear the first quote that you cited oh. from it. Sorry, fear of zombie defaults will divide into two trends. The first is the Fed will have to loosen credit. Right. Second, market participants will increasingly prefer gold to counterparty risk. So most people think the Fed, I shouldn't say most, the popular thought is the Fed cares about the stock market. I don't think they actually care about the stock market. What they care about is solvency, particularly of the big banks. But here's the thing. If you're a debtor in a publicly traded company, but you owe money to the banks, um, if you're getting close to default, your equity is worth zero. It's the creditors that, that are really going to take over the assets. And so if the Fed is trying to prevent defaults, effectively, it looks like they're trying to prevent stock market depression. Um, it's a great quote. I saw an economist, uh, a Scottish economist named Russell Napier, uh, Russell Napier uh, speak in London. And he said, um, equity is the thin line of hope between the liability and the asset. And of course, the liability is hard. If you owe a million dollars, there it is on a piece of paper. You owe a million dollars. If you don't pay us, we're going to foreclose on every asset you have. Um, and obviously not for public companies, but for small business, we're also going to take you up on that personal guarantee you signed as, as the owner of the business and you know take your house and, and everything else. Um, but the asset that you own, well, what's the value of the asset? That could be rather more mushy. Um, so uh, the Fed is going to want to avoid a cascade of defaults. So what I mean by that is if enough debtors default, then the creditor, who, who the, bank, the bank themselves borrowed money in order to lend it to these debtors, the bank itself now is suddenly um, insolvent. And so that would that would cascade through and ultimately unwind, you know, the entire monetary expansion since 1913. Probably not what the Fed wants. You know, people talk about this idea of a reset, and I always like to point out something. And I say, you know, whenever the the peasants break out the torches and the pitchforks and have a reset event, it's not usually the people that had been in power previous to that event that are still in power afterwards. Usually the people that are in power want to avoid that reset because they're going to lose their heads and certainly their power when that when that reset comes. So which means the Fed is not going to want this to happen. So the Fed is going to have to figure out how did you 
sufficiently ease conditions, or people use the analogy, how do you push on that string enough to pump credit into the markets sufficiently to avoid those defaults? Well, that is going to be a monetary easing that probably makes 2020 look like a little speed bump compared to the mountain that's coming. And um, so if you're if you're a saver, that you actually own some wealth and not uh, not a financial intermediary where you borrow from one party and lending to another uh, to make a spread, but you actually are an uh, individual, work hard for a living, built a business, sold a business, whatever, and you own some pile, some nest egg. Um, there's two things here that are going to make you look towards gold. And one is the monetary madness and, and promise of further, even bigger monetary madness than what's occurred before, which is already mad enough, and combined with at even lower interest rates. So you as the creditor are looking at greater risk and um, uh, and, and being paid less return to take that risk. Or on the other hand, if the Fed doesn't do it, you're looking at um, extreme risk of credit default, anything except the treasury bond anyways. Um, either way, you know, um, uh, of that, uh, fork in the road, both forks in the road kind of lead to gold. E either you're saying, I don't want to be a participant in this madness and for lower and lower interest rates, or you're looking at this saying, I don't want to be a creditor in a world that's about to have, you know, defaults cascading like a bunch of dominoes. I don't want to be one of those dominoes. So either way, you're saying, you know, gold looks more attractive than ever. Well said. You did write a little bit about silver. I like what you said about it being you know, more affordable. We all know that. And it's, well, I'll just read it because you said it better than I will paraphrase it. Silver, by contrast to gold, is the ideal vehicle for wage earners to save. They can buy silver with a portion of their wages every week. With physical gold, that's impractical. I want to expand on that. What I'd like to expand on is your best case scenario that these people that claim to be smarter than us have got this thing figured out one way or another, and we can somehow or other slide into the next system without too much pain, or the full-on pain scenario. So how do you see it, best case, worst case, from what you know now, you know, like you no know, Ukraine popping up, uh, like you finished in January, and here's February, and you had no idea, or maybe you had an inkling, but it certainly wasn't pertinent to the report because it hadn't happened yet. So barring that, from where we sit today, <clears throat> at the very end of February, give me your best and give me your worst. What do you see? When you say um, people that think there's, you mean the PhDs that run the monetary system? Well, yes, the piled higher and deeper. Yes, I do. And I know you're, you've got one, my you're, comment there, you're in a different class. Go ahead. My comment there is I've met quite a number of them, both in the US and around the world. and um, you know, some of them are pretty smart, but a lot of them really actually aren't. And, um, you know, they're really no different than anybody else. They just happen to be situated where they have that position of authority and power. Um, and they don't really get it. I mean, a lot of them are, are really, I, I use the analogy of a race car driver versus the mechanic, you know, the machinist who assembled the engine versus the engineer who designed it. The guy, you know, who knows how to drive the car, and not, not to take anything away from him, has a lot of skill at driving the car, but it's not exactly the guy you consult on how could you produce twice as much horsepower with half the half the weight or half the cost or whatever. Um, so I, I don't think they really get it. I think they're just operators, um, and frankly, they're enjoying the gravy train, which is great for them. Um, and, uh, you know, they want to continue. But I think... If we don't change the trajectory of the monetary system, and that, you know, not, not to toot my own horn, but that's kind of the whole point of monetary metals, is to drive that change, that, that trajectory. But if there isn't any change, then the system will fail when it consumes. It's not, the, the dollars collapse as a consequence of something else. It's not paper go down because there's more units of the paper or something. It's because we're destroying productive capital, we're consuming it. And, you know, my example of, of Bitcoin, but the same thing occurs in real estate and stocks, and antique cars and, and um, whiskey and wine and artwork. The same thing is occurring everywhere. One person is buying 
someone else some you know great consumer goods with his life savings because he expects the next person to buy him something even bigger with his life savings and um and if, if this process continues and of course the whole point is to finance the government to consume everybody's life savings in enormous quantities and at an exponentially growing rate i mean the cost of the welfare state uh not to mention the warfare state is it's just you know growing 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 then where this ends is when you know, it's all consumed it's all burned out it's a husk and um so i, I wrote my i guess you could call it seminal paper uh, when gold backwardation becomes permanent. I think I wrote that in, I don't know, 2010 or 2011. It was a long time ago at this point. And that's kind of a blow by blow of the mechanics of how the system fails. And then by the end of that, you'll be able to stick a fork in it, the dollar, and it'll be done. Um, there isn't any way on, on the current trajectory, you know, we're on the rails and we're going to follow the rails. And that's where the rails lead is right off the edge into the abyss. And, um, you know, people say, well, we'll pay off the debt with inflation. No, 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 no. Inflation is the process of borrowing more. Sure, perhaps each dollar that you owe is worth a bit less than it used to be, but you owe exponentially more of them. You cannot get out of a hole by digging it deeper. And so um, there, isn't, there isn't any way out. Default, if people say, well, you should have a jubilee. Great. As long as you understand that everything that everybody considers to be money will be wiped out. Imagine waking up one morning, you don't have any bank accounts, your employer doesn't have any bank accounts either, nor does your pension fund, your insurance company, et cetera. How is anybody going to buy food? So, um, uh, you know, on the current trajectory, it just leads to, uh, you know, the destruction uh, of everything. And then, you know, we can debate how long that takes. Adam Smith said there's a great deal of ruin in a nation that takes longer than you think it does. Um, or, so that's a really bleak scenario, and that's really, really bleak. Um, or if, if the world begins to seriously move towards re-monetizing gold or re-recognizing re that gold is money and it's been money all along, uh, you know, to the point where we started out this discussion that all the gold that's been mined in human history is still in human hands. There isn't a glut of it. Every bit that comes out of the mines is readily absorbed by the market at you know higher and higher prices and that's been true not the higher prices but you know that's been true for five thousand years whatever they produce the market is ready to absorb which is exactly what you'd expect money that's how money should behave there isn't any you know people don't say i don't want any more money right. um so if if gold is re you know returns to a role in the financial system and gold begins to circulate then we can change trajectories um and get off of this crazy train you know, in, into something better and something that works and something that's sustainable. If we don't, then it just gets worse and worse. And, uh, um, you know, eventually, you know, we get, we get to a very blue place that I don't like to talk about too much, but there isn't, there isn't any way off in the current system, the current people in charge, the current dollar dynamics, um, you know, all just inexorably leads to that bitter end. Keith, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to uh, give you the final word. So I just want everyone to know that uh, on my website, the landing page is themorganreport.com. You have the uh, <clears throat> blog at the top. You pull the blog tab and just click on the blog, and you'll see a lot of the videos I've done. This will be posted very soon with Keith. And over on the right-hand side, we have... Uh, some icons for different things like our YouTube channel and that kind of thing. If you scroll down, we have a section called Worth a Look. And in that, we have like a silver stacker program. We have the digital gold and silver um, system load, which I'm an ambassador for. And below that is monetary metals. It says earn silver, earn gold on gold. Click here. That is our link for Keith. So before I forget, that's one way to get there. There's a more direct way, and that's to go to Keith's website directly. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about that? It is uh, monetary-metals.com, and we pay interest on gold and silver in gold and silver. And um, the neat thing about that is 
We're not saying, hey, participate in this because one day we're going to create a utopia and it's going to be great for mankind. We're saying, hey, participate in this because it makes it appeals to your self-interest. Would you rather would you rather get paid so the treasury bond again, the yield is falling? Would you rather give Uncle Sam the use of your money for 10 years and get 1.8% in dollars, which they promise are going to go down by 2% a year in value? Or would you rather own gold and silver? I presume most of the people listening to this would prefer gold and silver. And then if you own gold and silver, would you prefer to pay 75 uh, basis points to store it? Or would you prefer to get paid 2 or 3% interest to, uh, to put into productive work and help the world get to, uh, get to the gold standard where gold and silver you know, reemerge as a circulating media of exchange? So that's our whole, that's our whole pitch uh, kind of in a nutshell. Okay, it's always enlightening to speak with you, and it's fun. I'm glad I got to meet you in person a few times. Now that uh, we've got something else to take our attention in the news feed, other than uh, face diapers, we will uh, stay in touch. Is there, I think we've covered it all, and I don't want to rehash what we've already done, but just in case, is there one burning thing you really need to get out before we close? Um, be careful out there, and uh, don't necessarily use leverage. That's the, sort of the final thought that I would uh, impart. Well said, Van, very important. Yours truly learned that the hard way. All right, uh, thank you again, and um, keep the cars and letters coming. We enjoy reading your work. All right, thank you, David. <laughs>